to new roles. So I think that's good afternoon, problem. everyone. Right. Or uh, good morning for those of you on the phone, maybe from the West Coast. Uh, um, welcome. Uh, I'm George Constantine. I am a co-chair of the Nonprofit Organizations Group here at Venable, and would like to welcome you to uh, this month's uh, luncheon presentation on uh, nonprofit mergers, alliances, and joint ventures, options, best practices, and practical tips. Um, we are, have a great panel, which I'll introduce in a second, but before getting to that, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. First, for those of you who are uh, CAE uh, holders, we, we do have CAE credit for, for this program. Um, there's information on the, in the booklet on um, how to uh, get credit for this, uh, for this program's attendance. Also coming up uh, in, in the next couple months, just so you, you see what's on the calendar for our next monthly events, we have on March 15th a program on sexual harassment. Uh, what should your nonprofit be doing to keep itself out of the headlines and out of legal hot water? Expect a lot of interest in that one, given what we've been seeing in the news lately. And then after that, we have on April 19th uh, a, a government contracts focused pr uh, presentation on nonprofit issues, uh, post award non compliance disclosures, and audit resolution. And uh, obviously, we'll, we'll get the invites out for those uh, soon enough, and you can, can register for those um, when they come. Um, so before I introduce our, our panel, uh, I was going to uh, just go, go over briefly what, what, what they plan to talk about and sort of the order of, of, um, of discussion that we have for today. We have a great panel, and I think we, I'm really looking forward to an interesting discussion. I hope uh, you all can uh, help participate with, with questions and comments as well. Um, we'll start sort of with the setting of the stage, and, and, and at least Scott will, will do that, and, and then go through a, a more sort of detailed walkthrough of some of the issues, legal and otherwise, that, that come into play with a merger, consolidation, affiliation. Um, then go over types of deal structures that, that we commonly see in this world. And um, then we have a great case study. One of our panelists, Tom Dente, will, will go over um, how his merger uh, went forward and, and give some lessons learned discussion there. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the, the key legal and, and, and non-legal considerations that, that, that arise whenever you consider combining uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, so really looking forward to that. And we'll, we'll, the full bios for each of our panelists are in, your, are in your materials. I'll just sort of hit the highlights. To my far left is Scott Kottenoff, and Scott is a partner with La Piana Consulting, which is a strategic organization focused on assisting nonprofits and, and, and giving, giving them direction and assistance. Uh, prior to, to being a partner at, at this organization, Scott was a Senior Vice President of Programs at the New York City Partnership for Homelessness. Next to Scott is Tom Dente. Tom's president and CEO of Humentum. Uh, uh, until very recently, uh, he was president and CEO of Inside NGO. Uh, after the merger, the, the, the name changed, so he has some, some great experiences to talk about in, in connection with the merger that, that took place recently for his organization. Uh, Tom was, before being president and CEO, you were uh, chief operating officer of, of uh, Inside NGO, and then prior to that, uh, served as a management consultant uh, with uh, Bain and & Company and uh, A.T. Kearney. So, welcome, Tom. And last but not least, to my immediate left is Andrew Steinberg. Andrew is an associate here in the Nonprofit Organizations Practice Group, has done tremendous work on uh, all matter of nonprofit organization issues, tax exemption, tax issues, contracts, uh, governance issues, uh, and, and most uh, importantly for this presentation, a lot of work on our clients' uh, mergers, uh, joint ventures, affiliations, and those sorts of things. And I think you'll find that Andrew has a wealth of uh, experience to, to call upon and, and talk about. So. I think with that, we're going to start with Scott, um, and I'm going to hand you the, the keys here. And we're on the road. This is the car. Great. Hopefully I know how to drive. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those of you uh, in a different time zone. Um, I'm pleased to be here, and I appreciate the invitation from our, our host today, and also appreciate you all coming to spend some time with us and have this conversation. Um, just by way of introduction, um, I want to just point out that the, the comments and experience that um, I'll be sharing today are based on our firm's uh, close to 20-year experience doing mergers and strategic partnerships with nonprofits of all shapes and sizes um, throughout the country, um, and uh, my own per past personal experience as an executive director of an organization that went through a merger. So I had the, the joy of trying to balance running an organization with trying to figure out a merger and everything in between, um, as well as providing support. Um, 
what we want to start with is just to give you a bit of an overview of what the process trajectory can look like. Um, and you'll see from this first slide that the, the reference is to a, a combination process. And um, I think it's appropriate that it's a, a more general term because a lot of the issues that we'll talk about are relevant whether you're thinking about a fully integrated merger or a less integrated strategic relationship. Um, obviously, there are differences, but in terms of the thought process that you may go, in, may go through going into the discussions, and then some of the discussions and some of the considerations are actually very, um, very similar. So as you can see, it, it starts with um, a bit of a strategic assessment. And um, the key point here that we want to make is that strategic partnerships um, should be thought of as one of your tools to help strengthen your organization. Uh, uh, whether it's a merger or some other relationship is not the kind of thing where you wake up one morning and say, we should merge. Um, rather, part of a considered set of discussions and thinking about how a partnership of some sort can actually help strengthen your organization and advance your mission. And so before entering into any kind of discussions, you should have a, a sense of what's going on inside your organization and what you need. Uh, clarity around your, uh, your vision and your goals as an organization, what you want to accomplish, where perhaps you may not be fully achieving that, and if and how a partnership might be able to advance your, your mission, um, and also being thoughtful about and brutally honest about where you're strong as an organization and where you may be challenged, where you have excess capacity and where you may have limitations in your capacity. As a way to think about who might be an appropriate partner, uh, a complementary partner to work with you to then advance the goals that you're trying to achieve. So really going through a specific intentional assessment of your organization internally before turning outside to think about what organizations might be inappropriate, uh, might be appropriate as a partner. Um, and in thinking about external organizations, um, one of the, the things that we stress with folks is that it need not be, a partnership need not be, and in fact is often less successful, when a potential partner shares the exact same mission that you do. Trying to think about ways that you can complement your work, that you can broaden your work and strengthen your work with the resources and experience of another organization um, often results in greater impact. And so as you do a bit of a survey of the landscape and think about who might be an appropriate potential partner or set of partners, it's helpful to be a little flexible in terms of how you think about achieving your mission and who might fit in and who might complement your work. And again, going through a very specific and intentional process of first identifying what you're looking for in a partner and then scanning first your, your local community, who have you worked with, who do you know, um, and then broadening it out to identify organizations that might be appropriate to engage in discussions. Um, and then you turn to the discussions. And the, the negotiation piece is a a process by which the organizations really drill down to an understanding of the nature of the relationship. What is it you're trying to achieve together? What is the structure, the, the organizational structure? How do the programs or activities fit together? How do your cultures as an organization fit together? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through. Um, and Sort of parallel to that is the notion of due diligence. And in, in the due diligence phase, which um, others will, will cover later on, it's critically important to understand both the financial health as well as the sort of le potential legal exposure of your partner and for them to understand the same about you. Um, and I stress with organizations that this is not necessarily to put a stop sign to the relationship, although that can happen depending on the information, but really to help the, the two or more organizations think about how you're going to manage in an integrated way 
the potential liabilities or exposures that you may have, or whether certain exposures need to be resolved before you actually get into the relationship, or whether there needs to be certain kinds of financial investments by one or another partner so that the, the, um, the integration can actually succeed. So you go through this discussion, um, again, a very intentional, um, rigorous discussion and analysis of the various issues that are important, um, and do the due diligence. Assuming there's agreement, then there are, are processes which vary state by state, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and also based on the type of relationship that you're going to develop for legal documentation, um, agreements, whether there are regulatory bodies that need to be engaged. Um, we like to recommend that the, the lawyers get involved as early in the, in the process as possible, once there seems to be some momentum, uh, because the, the due diligence process can take time. And then depending on the relationship and the jurisdiction in which you're operating, the regulatory approval process can either be fairly pro forma or can be fairly involved and extensive. Um, much of my work is in New York, uh, New York State, and to merge in New York State, you need to get approval from the Attorney General, which depending on the, the week or the month could take you know, two weeks or it could take six months. Um, and so the, the challenge there is to just be mindful of what that timing is so that you can actually plan for it and build it into your operations. Um, and then, uh, from our experience, um, that's all the easy part. Right? And the hard part is actually making the relationship work. What are the actual on-the-ground changes that need to happen, cultural changes, structural changes, operational changes, and putting those in place. Uh, and not expecting that those changes will just happen, um, but again, being very thoughtful and intentional about how those changes, what you're trying to accomplish with those changes, and how they need to happen. So just a, a few thoughts about why uh, consider partnerships. Um, the, the main point here, you can certainly see what's on the, the slide. The main point here is that uh, our experience has shown that relationships in the nonprofit sector have a greater likelihood of success when there is mission alignment, when there's mission complementarity, and when the, the goal of the relationship is strengthening the mission, that in nonprofits, there is often very little redundancy around staff, uh, with the exception perhaps of some operation staff, some administration staff, administrative staff. And so the cost savings are likely not to be significant. Rather, the strengthening of the organization's ability to achieve its mission and then position the organization actually to achieve growth from a financial perspective, so take advantage of opportunities, should be the primary driver. If you're thinking of a financial crisis and you're going to solve it by merger, the likelihood is that, that, is that that's not a recipe for long-term success. So as you're, you're thinking about uh, whether to move into a, a relationship or whether to pursue a relationship, um, the word that we keep coming back to, that I keep coming back to, is intentionality. Right? So being thoughtful about and clearly defining what your goals are as an organization and then whether and how a partnership might actually help you achieve those goals. Uh, being clear about what kind of organization you believe makes sense as a partner, as a fit, from a capacity perspective, from a mission perspective, and from a cultural perspective. Uh, it, it's important to, to keep in mind the notion of culture. Most relationships don't succeed or are less successful than they could be not because of disagreements around IT or knowledge management or HR policies and procedures, but because of culture. Um, and the idea is, particularly in a more integrated structure, is you want to operate in an integrated way. And so being thoughtful about culture 
and about the culture of a potential partner is a critical piece. Um, again, coming to the table with a clear understanding of what you bring to the table and what you hope the a potential partner brings to the table and what the implications are of that around staffing and finances and how you do your business, whatever your business is. Um, having a bit of a, a rough outline of how you envision this relationship to work, but also being flexible enough so as the discussions unfold, you may understand opportunities in a different way. And your potential partner may bring information to you that you had not thought of. Um, and then be clear about who's going to be your face in the discussions. Um, identify, ideally, folks from the governing body, folks from the staff leadership to work jointly on this. These discussions work best when there are um, both perspectives in the conversation um, and when champions for the, the discussions and for the potential relationship come from both the governing level and governing perspective um, and the staff perspective. It's also important to understand that um, this is not a sort of go to the store and buy a relationship off the rack kind of situation. Um, when I work with organizations, one of the first things I say to them and then I stress with them is that we're gonna first figure out what you want to achieve and figure out how that would work. And then we'll talk about what the structure is that gets you there, as opposed to coming in and saying, you all should merge and let's figure out how you merge. Because what's important is setting the organizations up so that you can maximize your impact. And so that mission focus is one of the key drivers of success. And as I mentioned earlier, flexibility in how you pursue your mission, how you achieve your mission is also important. So for example, if you're a um, uh, homelessness prevention services provider and you provide housing and social services, an employment or workforce development organization may actually be a great partner, even though you don't do workforce development programming, because combined, you can have a greater impact on the communities that you serve. So being open to that kind of flexibility in how you do your work and the work that you do is, often a, a, is also a driver of, of success. Um, important to understand that a, a merger or a strategic partnership is 9.5 times out of 10, not a salve for an immediate crisis. Um, we often get calls from, periodically get calls from organizations who say, you know, we're not gonna be able to make payroll in a month, we need to merge. Merger's not gonna help you there. Um, obviously there are other things going on. Um, which is why it's important on an ongoing basis to think from a strategic perspective how partnerships and relationships may help advance, um, advance your mission and advance your impact. Um, clarity around what you're trying to achieve, um, having some experience with your potential partners also are key indicators of success, um, and having some cohesiveness within your organization about the value of a partnership is also important. When you get into the negotiations, you don't wanna have your board chair saying, yes, let's go forward with this, this is a great idea, while your CEO is throwing bombs to, to kind of blow up the discussions. You wanna make sure that there's constructive and thoughtful analysis of the issues, but that you have those kind of disagreements you know, in, in the back room. Quickly, in terms of, of some roadblocks, uh, I mentioned culture before. Autonomy is often a, a key challenge. Um, for folks coming into this kind of discussion, particularly when it feels like it's leaning toward a merger, notions of control, autonomy, decision-making, um, the sort of emotional connection to your organization can be among the biggest challenges to overcome. It's important to think about, and it's one reason why we always start with a mission discussion, that the goal is to figure out how to ensure that the mission continues, that the mission is strengthened, not how to ensure that your organization continues. 
And if you can help folks get past that hurdle, then you're more likely to have a fruitful, fruitful discussion. But if folks are have locked into a sense of, well, you know, we make decisions and, and we need to make the decisions going forward, then you might as well not be having the conversations because you're not, that's not, doesn't reflect an openness to a relationship. Um, that's more of a desire for a takeover. Um, and the final challenge um, that you need to be mindful of and it's something that only you can really think about and, and understand is a notion of trust. And when we talk of trust in this context, we think about uh, how the other organization has um, done its business. Do they abide by and adhere to their obligations? Do they deliver what they say they're going to deliver? Do they show up when they say they're going to show up? What's your, your sense of that? Um, do you feel like their word actually is legitimate and that they're not one of those organizations that, unfortunately, we all know, have very nice annual reports, but when you look behind the surface, there's actually not much going on. Um, you want to be in a place with a potential partner that you feel that you can trust, that their word is, is legitimate, that their work has value, and that they feel the same about you. So now I'm going to turn it over. Okay. That's great. Thank, Thank you, you, Scott. So once there's enough groundswell in the process between the parties and the strategic assessment is well underway, how do you go about approaching another partner from a process-oriented perspective? And flexibility, as Scott mentioned, is very key. And while the next two slides will outline the typical key milestones in the uh, life cycle of any type of combination transaction, it's important to recognize that many of these steps can happen in, happen in parallel and also that um, there's multiple ways to go about each phase. So typically, uh, the parties will start either by adopting a non-disclosure agreement which contains confidentiality obligations, or by adopting a letter of intent that is a more detailed document than a typical non-disclosure agreement and sets out various items, including what is the contemplated basis of the transaction? What will the parties be doing over the next several months? How long will the parties engage in discussions for? Will there be any exclusivity in the discussions, which is commonly uh, called a, a no-shot provision, where either side can't talk with um, other parties about the same substance of the transaction. What types of conditions might there be to consummating an eventual transaction? What exit rights do you have? These are all questions that the parties will need to address together and will be different in each given transaction. But the form of a letter of intent, how rigorous it may be, what provisions to include, will really depend on the parties, their respective negotiating leverage. And I think it's important, especially when your organization is approaching another organization, you don't want to scare away a potential partner with presenting a very complicated, lengthy, legalistic letter of intent always. So the letter of intent can range anywhere from being as simple as two pages, five pages, ten pages. Um, I think the important point to emphasize is it's not always best to have a handshake deal about the discussions that you are going to have because the diligence process will entail the exchange of very sensitive and proprietary information. And in case the deal falls through, what happens to the destruction of that information the return of that information, what liabilities do the parties have with respect to outside advisors that they've engaged or the other costs that they've incurred during the negotiation process. And so the letter of intent is really the vehicle by which many of these preliminary yet common issues are dealt with on a relatively routine basis. So once the letter of intent is in place, 
The negotiations continue from the strategic assessment, and they go forward, but at a more detailed level. For example, if the organizations will be merging together, and we'll talk later about the various structures that are available, the size of the board of directors may change. The officers of the organization may change. And the parties should be on the same page as to what will the future combined organization look like from a governance perspective, from an operational perspective, from a programmatic perspective, if there's going to be any capitalization involved in the, in the transaction, what does that look like? How will that be calculated? And meanwhile, as part of those discussions and negotiations, the parties are going to be learning about each other. In some transactions, it may only be a one-way diligence process in that one organization is looking at a smaller organization and is not sharing any of its own sensitive information, but is looking at the books, the records, interviewing employees and, and officers about the functions of their potential partner. The way that diligence typically starts is through the exchange of document and information requests, either through emails or um, nice organized checklists, which I, I tend to prefer, um, because it's often the time that diligence is not a one-way conversation and it's not a one-time conversation. It's definitely an, an evolution and it's a process. And we see a lot of times that informa information can be difficult to collect, it can be difficult to process, and it can contain some surprises that may even be unknown to your partner. But the purpose of diligence is, is, is like going to the doctor and getting a checkup and, and really understanding how the other partner is functioning and where maybe there are issues that need to be worked on, where preventative health is necessary. Um, and, and ultimately, the purpose of diligence is so that the parties are reasonably informed that the transaction that they are going to be entering into is in the best interests of both organizations. Because directors and officers of nonprofit organizations have a fiduciary duty and the diligence process is the, is the mechanism by which directors can demonstrate that they have thoughtfully considered the transaction and that they understand the risks and liabilities that will be assumed upon consummation of the transaction. We often receive questions from concerned clients when there is a difficult issue that's discovered in the diligence process and worrying if it's a real, the difference between a, a, a real red flag and, and something that is a common issue that we see and is not a deal killer, but maybe should be addressed. It's not necessarily so much the particular issues that have been discovered, but what's key here is the fact that there was a process that was taken to understand that there's a potential issue and to have knowledge of an issue. I would just say as a, a practical matter, in, in my experience, a lot of times um, uh, organizations are great at collecting this information, but often not as great at actually reviewing very closely what's been provided. And it's not just up to the lawyers, because a lot of this stuff, as Scott pointed out, is um, it's more about is it, is it a fit? Is it, you know, working for your sort of, a, you know, a good cultural fit, a good combination? Is the mission really aligned? Um, and so it's really important to make sure you staff that diligence review well. Um, so, you know, the lawyers are reviewing what the lawyers should be doing, but also the finance people are reviewing what they should be reviewing. And whatever subject matter expert you want is actually getting a close look at that. So um, just uh, collecting the information is, is, not, is not all you need to do. And, and I think, too, preserving the information and recording the information on an ongoing basis if you're contemplating entering into a combination because your organization may be asked to provide your documents to a potential partner. And so having your corporate governance documents updated and easily accessible, having well-prepared minutes, having your key and material contracts available will all help facilitate 
a diligence process, and 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 those are the key the key areas that can, if you have the documents ready, it can speed up the process much more quickly. And, and oftentimes, a source of delay is that, especially in volunteer-led organizations, not everything is in a centralized location. I have a question. Um, I appreciate uh, you know what you're saying about the checklist, and you mentioned contracts and other documents. Are there other documents that you would recommend in this due dil diligence process mm -hmm. that one should see or both parties should see? Uh, absolutely, and that's a fantastic question. So the, the types of documents that we typically will look for are the governing documents of an organization, which are the articles of incorporation, including all amendments the current bylaws that are on file, the latest um, and up-to-date minute book of the organization that includes the minutes of all meetings of the board of directors, and if there are any members, the meetings of the members, any uh, board resolutions, uh, consents, written consents of the directors or of the members to demonstrate actions that were taken without meetings, the latest... Um, conflict of interest disclosure forms, as well as other key organizational policies, if there's a policy manual. From an accounting perspective, all, the finances. all of the financial documents, including the IRS Form 990s, um, a copy of uh, any determination letter from the IRS as to exempt status, as well as any local or foreign authorities as to exempt status. A lot of what we ask for is not so much the documents, but also uh, representations and warranties that um, there are no existing um, litigation. Or, you know, and also, it, it, as it gets further down and gets more sensitive, things like employee files and things like that may be something that you need to, to, to look at. Um, a lot of times we've encountered hiccups in due diligence on the employee benefits programs, for instance. Lawyers have reviewed a program that you think is going just fine with your 401K or whatever it might be, and lo and behold, um, th there are issues with that. I mean, look, you're getting... In the, most of these combinations, you know, one or the other organization is assuming the other organization's sort of history, you know, warts and all. Um, so, you know, you'll see our, we have a form list, and it's, yeah. it's pretty comprehensive, um, and it goes uh, well beyond contracts. One other thing just for nonprofits that's important as well is we want to take a close look at what uh, restrictions there are on gifts. Um, if we're going to combine and there are some uh, endowments or re restricted gifts and funds and things like that, we really want to see what those are all about and how those restrictions could affect uh, the combination. Mm -hmm. right. I just want to say quickly that um, that's an area that often – that we found often trips people up is restrictions on gifts or grant agreements, particularly if you have organizations that are in two jurisdictions that may have different kinds of regulations, um, and if some of the money it comes from public sources. So it's really important to provide, to review, and also to provide the attorneys with all of your grant agreements, all of your contract agreements, anything related to funding so that they can review not only to see if there are, are potential challenges, but that also has implications for the decision about where you might locate a merged organization yeah. in which of the jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And what might be appropriate for diligence in one transaction may not be appropriate in another either. And it's despite having the forms of diligence checklists, it's important to tailor diligence to a given transaction in an asset acquisition where one organization is acquiring a program of another, full-blown diligence of the entire scale of operations of an organization may not be necessary. So once diligence is complete and assuming there are no red flags or issues that scare the parties away, uh, the, the, the board of, of the organization should discuss the diligence findings, and, and this is part of the fiduciary duty element, but in, in terms of fulfilling fiduciary duties, but that documenting what has been discovered through diligence, and more importantly, creating a game plan for addressing and re remediating any issues that are discovered during the diligence process. One area that tends to trip organizations up are the contractual assignments. Um, yeah. And most contracts will contain boilerplate language at the end of the contract that 
this contract can't be assigned by either party without the consent of the other party. And depending on the, the structure of the transaction, one organization may have to go to their contractual counterparty and obtain a contractual consent. So reviewing the contracts, understanding which contracts require consent, it, it, it's, it's a good checklist to have in place, assuming that the parties will move forward with signing a definitive agreement. So moving on to the definitive agreement and what that looks like and, and how you get there. Oftentimes, it's more involved and detailed than the simple letter of intent. Depending on the complexity of the transaction, the parties may develop a term sheet during negotiations, which sets forth the key principles that will be included in the definitive agreement. And, and I, I, to clarify, the, a definitive agreement is the operative con contractual agreement that will be executed by the parties to affect the transaction, whatever it may be. And it may include ancillary documents that would need to be filed with regulatory authorities. So common terms that are found in a definitive agreement we'll be discussing later, but the definitive agreement should be presented to the board of directors for approval. Depending on the form of transaction, it may need to be presented to your membership if there is a membership. And there's also back and forth between the parties about the content of the definitive uh, agreement. The parties may agree in principle as to certain representations and warranties, but what's the legal language that will be used? And I think the most important takeaway is that from a contract law perspective, it's very important to document the present intent of the parties within the four corners of the agreement because a reviewing court will look at the terms that the parties negotiated in good faith with each other. The definitive agreement will also contain closing conditions and what those are is or a certain series of events or occurrences that have to be satisfied before the transaction will be deemed to occur. There's often lag time in between the date of signing an agreement that, okay, we're moving forward to getting to that point where, okay, we're done. And the typical closing conditions that you see are one, that diligence hasn't turned up any nasty surprises and that, uh, that the parties are satisfied that diligence has been completed. Two, you normally see a material adverse change clause, meaning that there has been no change materially in the operations, the programs, the finances, the legal status, the tax status of the other entity, that the parties have obtained all necessary approvals for the consummation of the transaction, which can involve board approval, member approval, and in certain states, approval from the attorney general's office, uh, especially, or, or providing notice to the attorney general's office. And one key element of the closing conditions is that sometimes the parties will specify a deadline for the closing conditions to occur, a, a drop dead date. So if the closing conditions haven't been satisfied by date X, the transaction won't happen, or the parties can agree to extend for a specified time period or an agreed upon time period to continue working through the closing conditions that the parties have agreed upon. And, and the particular closing conditions will depend and change on, on the transaction. And in certain cases, a party may decide to waive a closing, con closing condition and proceed nonetheless. And then lastly, once the deal is sailing through and, and the parties are, are moving forward, it's always important to 
notify your key stakeholders and have a communications plan in place and a public announcement plan in place. It's important to be on message um, and to have, I, I think, especially in the membership organization context, to have uh, readily available question and answers, to have press releases ready to go. And hopefully at this point, the diligence process has uncovered the, the systems that the other organization has in place that the integration can happen rather seamlessly. And Tom can speak to, to more of the, uh, some of the challenges that can arise in an integration process. Just on that point, particularly with membership organizations, um, um, that's a huge part of, of, of getting a, a merger or other big transaction through, um, you know, it, oftentimes the board and the chief, sort of the, the C-suite staff are very well focused on what's going on, and they've had time to understand how it's going to work, and they're getting excited about it. But if you haven't brought your membership along with that and, and sort of really got them excited about it, mm -hmm. um, that membership vote can be a real wild card. And, and you know, without that sort of advance work uh, in advance, uh, you, well, the advance work in advance, without that advance work, you're, you're, you're you may jeopardize the whole deal because the membership uh, approval may not go through. So due diligence, look before you leap. I think we could have used other cartoons here, maybe a Titanic ship going into the iceberg and seeing what's on underwater, but you get the picture. <laughs> um, it's important for the parties to understand and, and evaluate what is going on with the potential partner. I've listed here some key hotspots that we typically tend to, to come across during the diligence process. What we often see is that, for example, on the tax exemption issues, that sometimes an organization's tax exemption has automatically lapsed because they haven't filed their annual return with the IRS. And so, before you can consummate the transaction, the other organization will have to go through the process of reinstating their tax exemption. Sometimes corporate status has lapsed. There may be other challenges related to corporate separateness if the entity which is being acquired consists not just of one legal entity, but a variety of affiliated organizations which the entity that is being acquired controls. Uh, sometimes insurance policies are out of date, don't accurately reflect the geographic coverage or the programs that an organization is undertaking. Data privacy practices has become a, 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 a very recent uh, area, um, and we had a program on this last last month, but for, for organizations and how they are retaining uh, sensitive information about their employees, about their members, how that information exchanges hands domestically, internationally. Employment practices compliance. Sometimes we see joint uh, co-employment right. concerns. I, the list goes on and on. We could probably have a separate program about particular diligence issues, but um, that's what we normally what we normally see. So what type of structure is the best fit for an organization and its potential partner? And there are a variety of many choices to be had, and each one has different procedural mechanisms and different legal, effects, but the precise form that any given transaction will take will not only be based on legal considerations, based on the, the diligence, but also the negotiating leverage of the parties, what the parties are hoping to do post-transaction, what the uh, tax status of the entities might be. So there's no one way to structure any given transaction, and parties can be very creative about how they will approach a combination in a way that is suitable to both sides of the equation. I, I think one, one thing that we always 
hope to accomplish in any transaction is that after the combination, one plus one should equal three. But how you do the equation is not always the same way. Yeah, and it, it, what sometimes it's it's just uh, from a practical perspective, um, the types of combinations that we're thinking about are one could be just an asset transfer where you're transferring a, a lot of assets over to the new organization and the old organization sort of goes away, not, or not the new, but the existing organization. Um, you could have a merger where obviously it's a, it's a statutory uh, transaction. Um, one of the considerations between those, that decision making could be how many assignments do we need to get for our contracts? How difficult will it be? You know, a merger often by operation of law, those contracts assign. You don't have to get approval from the other side if you do that. Um, but also the, the more sort of um, um, sort of mission-related um, concerns might be, well, we do want to keep our organization afloat and, and, and perhaps do this or that limited project under the old organization's name and, and, and leadership. So you may have a control relationship where there's really no uh, dissolution or, 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 or disappearance of the old organization, but rather a um, uh, it just sort of transfers a lot of its assets but continues a smaller focus um, with, with a, a, a focused activity or program. So those are some of the, the ways you could um, look to combine without merging. Go ahead. We'll repeat it. Question is, how would we structure a combination where it's in, in an incubation sort of scenario where you have a small nonprofit with a, a, a for-profit company that's willing to uh, support it and provide resources to it to, to grow? Um, I, I would say you, know, you, you can never sort of transfer ownership of a nonprofit to a for-profit. Um, and, and the incubator in, in the, the for-profit world suggests, oh, we're going to sort of participate in some upside later on. Um, the upside for the corporation in this situation for the for-profit is, is um, knowing that its mission is or, you know, its, its social justice and um, social responsibility mission is being fulfilled. But ultimately, the control of the nonprofit um, would, would still rest with its board, right? I, I don't see any other way around that. You may want to have these uh, investors maybe get closer to participating on the board or, or you know, have some, some role on them. But you do have to be careful about them controlling or coming into a control situation where it may appear that the, the, the for-profit is taking over. So as to the various types of, of combinations and this, this list goes from a true marriage to something less than that. So a, a statutory merger is when one organization will combine with and into another organization and the combined organization, one organization survives and the organization that merged disappears, no longer exists, terminates out of existence. And all of the debts, liabilities, assets of the disappearing corporation automatically transfer to the surviving corporation. Each state nonprofit corporation statute is they're similar but, but slightly different. But in order to affect a merger, the procedures that are provided for in the state law of both the disappearing organization and the surviving organization have to be filed. What that typically involves is the filing of articles of merger with the state corporations regulators in each state. And the requirements for the content of the articles of merger can be different in each state as well as the process by which articles of merger have to be approved. But in most instances, board approval and membership approval, if there are members of both organizations, and if you're in a jurisdiction like New York or California, regulatory approval uh, or notification as well. In contra and, and what's great about a merger is that it's rather, rather seamless in that everything everything goes. Um, but the downside of that is if 
you know, there could be bad things in the bathwater too. Um, and a consolidation is the is the stepchild of the merger, I think, in that it's really both organizations extinguish out of existence and a new legal entity is formed. New EIN, new tax exempt status, similar procedures to merger, but you follow the state, the state law. And the ultimate net result of a merger consolidation is that the two entities no longer have a separate legal existence from each other. The organization will be one and the same legally. And the form of that structure can drive very sensitive discussions about what will the future governing body of the combined organization look like. Similar to merger, but, but slight twist, is an asset acquisition followed by the disappearing organization undertaking a process known as dissolution, which is a way to voluntarily terminate an organization's existence. In this case, the acquiring organization can, in certain instances, seek to one, pick and choose what exactly it will be acquiring, and two, limit the liabilities that it's taking on. Typically, not uh, the, the, organiz the acquiring organization would not assume liabilities that occurred prior to the acquisition date. And one of the benefits of an asset acquisition and dissolution process is that the acquiring organization only needs to go to its its board, right. um, but beware if you are a dissolving corporation that most states will require uh, board and membership approval and potentially regulatory approval if the asset transfer will be uh, substantial or, or or all of the organization's assets. I'd pull out a dictionary. I don't know if yeah. there's a numerical percentage or a dollar figure that's set with Let's just say the regulators take a very broad view as to what is substantial. So uh, err on the side of filing if you feel it's uh, close. And then short of operating as a combined entity or taking everything out and bringing it over to the other organization is a program acquisition or an ent entity acquisition, um, or it can be marketed as a strategic affiliation, um, where two in a pro in a program acquisition is similar to an asset acquisition in that the assets related to the operation of a program, potentially employees who carry out that program day to day, will move over to the new organization. In an entity acquisition or strategic affiliation, the, the legal shell of the other organization will continue to exist. And that can be for any number of reasons. Sometimes it's to isolate the liabilities that are associated with the organization in a separate legal entity or it could be a requirement of local law. Sometimes foreign jurisdictions, in order to operate a, a charitable organization overseas, uh, you, you can't just have a branch office, but you may need to have a charitable organization that's formed under the local laws of the host country, and the governance of that organization may be dictated by local law, sometimes requiring um, residents of the host country to serve on the board uh, or for certain uh, financial uh, commitments to be to be made the requirements can vary sig significantly and then a joint a joint venture um, which can either be uh, it, a joint venture is defined as the pursuit of of an activity uh, for mutual gain or mutual loss. So you either win together or you lose together. Um, a joint venture can be structured as an, a, an entity joint venture where a new legal entity will be formed to conduct the activities 
of the joint venture. Um, typically, the most common venture entity structure is a limited liability corporation. If you're engaging in for-profit activities, it can also be a nonprofit corporation. It, it, the exact structure of a joint venture entity will depend on what the goals of the venture are. Um, and as an alternative to a joint venture entity would be a joint venture by contract where the parties remain separate legal entities or not forming a new, uh, a new legal entity, but the programs and functions of the venture will be carried out by, by the parties uh, pursuant to the terms of a written agreement. And then lastly, um, shared space and, and, and resources. This is seen in uh, much smaller organizations when uh, an organization will look for administrative services and staff support, and the parties can adopt an affiliation agreement that sets forth the terms um, by which one organization will provide resources and support to another organization. We often see this a lot of times um, with new charitable organizations and the fiscal sponsorship model, right. where an organization does not yet have tax exempt status and is applying to the IRS for tax exempt status, but would like to be able to offer donors deductibility of their contributions. So we'll partner up with an existing charitable organization and the charitable organization will take a little piece uh, off the top to cover their administrative expenses. All right, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Tom. Good, uh, thank you. I assume everyone can hear me well. I think what you're really struck by when you listen to what Andrew was just describing is there's so much creativity in terms of how you can structure what you're trying to accomplish back to your mission. And so I'm happy to just to tell an example of, you know, here's what we did based upon what we saw as Humentum. And it's some interesting uh, pieces of this that come back to what both, uh, both Scott and Andrew have said. So this was um, a merger not of one plus one equals two, but one plus one plus one should equal more than three. And so you had um, Inside NGO, which was a 501c3 here in the District of Columbia, Lingos, which was registered in the state of Washington, and then Mango, which is a registered charity in the UK. So there's both two 501c3s in addition to having a registered charity outside of the United States. So that was the nature of the combination that we were exploring. And for us, it was a statutory merger of, you know, merging Lingos into the inside NGO uh, shell, if you will, and then forming a strategic affiliation with Mango simultaneously, because we wanted to preserve that organization's unique charitable status in the UK for longer term, you know, strategic benefit in, as we serve our sector. And so why do this? You start to look at this and you say, there's a lot of complexity in that uh, as we went through putting these pieces together. And I think it came back to what I think Scott spent some time talking about is that you've got to start with mission first. What are we trying to accomplish? What's happening externally? And if we look around the nonprofit sector, there's a lot of stress, a lot of changes taking place in different domain areas, different program areas, and certainly the sector that we serve, which is international development and humanitarian organizations, it's a lot of change taking place. And both Mango, Lingos, and Inside NGO serve the sector, served organizations in the sector in very different ways. And so when we looked out ahead, we said, there are opportunities for us together to be even more relevant to the future to have a global entity that can provide more relevant services outside of the United States and really leverage the strengths of each of the organizations. So starting with mission first and this very simple question that we put to our boards along the way, if we do this, do we accelerate our strategy? Do we do more for what we've all collectively committed to do? And so that became a, a foundation point for us. And we talk a lot about mission and why mission matters, because we'll talk a bit about our process and, you know, the, the timetable that we went through to get to a combined entity called Humentum. But 
we kept coming back to this as a touchstone because being very clear about what are we trying to accomplish if we do this helps guide decision making and helps us bring people along both in our organization and then also as we talked earlier bringing our stakeholders along too both uh, our board stakeholders our member stakeholders and others who would look to us in our different communities and so for us it was you know let's be clear about this vision let's put together a new mission and we spent a lot of time on these words sounds funny when you see it but i recall you know the three ceos from each of the organization working over a summer on this sharing this with a board task force made up of two representatives from each of the boards so you know the group of us working through here's what this could mean if we did this and here's how we would deliver this as humentum in some of the areas of practice that you see illustrated on the slide in front of you so anchoring all of us here this is what we're trying to accomplish we're going to start a process to get us as close to this as we can um, we'll have some hiccups along the way but let's make sure we're, we keep the end in, in mind and i think we we decided pretty early on in our first meeting that we are going to go for this combined this full combination um, back to creativity because we thought that the issues in our sector were so profound that if we just did another joint venture another strategic alliance we're not going to get there we're not going to have the benefit and honestly that would probably take us a lot of time to put those in place and to manage those and we'd miss the broader opportunity because there's two schools of thought it's you know start small and do something bigger or start with something big like a big merger or combination um, and then put the pieces in place and we decided on the latter for for a number of different reasons and so our process took a while as you see our journey started off with um, putting together a strategic recommendation and think about each of these as almost um, decision gates if you will along the way and we've talked a little bit about fiduciary responsibilities and and other governance responsibilities but really important steps to walk us through a process that successively leverages trust and builds confidence because there's some intangibles beyond the structure of a due diligence checklist beyond you know the good pros you use in a strategic recommendation and the financial models that you make but how are you building confidence and enhancing trust as you go through this process especially as nonprofits and so I think you see strategic recommendations so working for a period of time um, to put together a recommendation that would include a number of different elements mission vision strategy governance proposed organization structure so that at that point each of the three boards could take a look at the same recommendation delivered to three different boards and say yes we get where you're going we get the decisions that have been put forward by this joint board task force and we agree to go ahead to the next step of due diligence and legal structuring um, with this vision in mind with the strategic recommendation so boards granting approval to say let's do this subject to due diligence and legal structure and so you can see we had this challenge of you know doing due diligence across three different organizations and so we did financial due diligence we entered into back to the creativity part we used one outside accounting firm to do financial due diligence across the three of us so you didn't have different organizations doing due diligence on each other and trying to manage all that information flow so that was a decision that we had taken and then as you see that took another six months to go through that process as, as Andrew and Scott have described and the way we thought about it was it's helping set us up for a better future in the sense that there's a fiduciary role of due diligence but when you think down the road to integration knowing the policies we have to address the contracts we have to manage the contracts we have to transition the relationships that are most important to us the people we need to bring along um, policy benefits changes we'll need to make help us set up a better due diligence or set up a better integration as we go along and so you know that process was concluded in another six months the boards then at that point did a formal approval and you say great all three boards agreed to this uh, this new entity along the way we had to call the new entity something right because we can't use our legacy name so 
we went through a, you know, a parallel naming process to come up with naming processes. And so think about naming. It's a combination of you have a good marketing firm helping you, saying, here's a nice name. And then you have your attorneys on the other side saying, that's a great name. But Amazon owns that, and you may not <laughs> want to take that name. Um, so there's a, there's a number of steps that are taking place in parallel so that when you reach that agreement, you can then begin to move pretty quickly into integration. So you can prepare for launch, have the public launch, and then put a reporting structure in place, and then start to work through a series of integration phases uh, with, a, with a real strong focus on culture. And this is something that is ongoing. We're about, as you see here, um, you know, we started the integration um, loosely with a new senior leadership team beginning to work together in March, but it really took place in July when we put our, started to put our new reporting structure in place. And so if you think about that, we're about eight months in to integration. There's a lot of work still to do. Um, but you want to structure integration in a way that you're beginning to show value and you're also managing risks and you're continuing to create that organization of the future that lives up to that touchstone mission that you talked about. And then what we've started to in parallel as well is this whole question of one plus one plus one has to be more than three. That promise that we put in front of our boards, in front of our members, and from our, in front of our constituents to say, let's refresh our strategy. Let's look for the new ways to add value over time and you know, continue to demonstrate that in the marketplace. So you know, a set of um, steps along the way. But I think what's most important about this is you know, mission first, board involvement, a degree of trust uh, across the organizations, and continuing to look at this as a series of we're building more and more confidence in what we're creating and we're creating more and more trust across our organizations as we as we move ahead. Happy to take questions and you know go into some additional details as we uh, as we conclude today. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, so what are the challenges? What were the down? Yeah, I think sides you had to deal with yeah, to any of the speakers. Yeah, big challenges. Came, I think, as George said before, in my past, I was in the private sector, and we always used to say in the private sector that mergers are challenging because of two big problems: egos and logos, right? And um, we talked a little bit about the logo issue, but think about this: getting organizations to agree, we are going to move from a brand that may have existed for a certain set of years to something new. You know, that takes some agreement. So I think that was one thing that we wanted to manage. In addition, governance. I think we've talked a lot about governance structure. So each organization had a, had a board, some up to 17 board members. You can't just put those board entities together. So during the course of the strategic recommendation, a lot of work back and forth to say, let's structure this new board. Let's have a smaller board. We'll allocate board seats roughly based upon the assets that each organization is bringing. But then more importantly, we're going to keep three board seats open. And the reason to do that is so that we can recruit board members for that future mission and vision that we had talked about. So we ended up having a starting board of eight with three open seats. And in our um, letters of agreement, a commitment in those agreements to recruit board members, new board members, over a period of time that would form part of that agreement or uh, that Andrew was talking about before. And so I think it was managing the, the, the governance issues and then I think, honestly, the leadership structure too. We had a you know, great organization forming which had three CEOs. Um, that's a hard structure to work with. And I think um, my two colleagues who, who are now part of our joint senior leadership team who were CEOs of the other organizations, what they did, which I think is rare and harder in the nonprofit sector, is they put mission above me. They put what we were trying to accomplish above what their leadership role would, would be in the organization. I'm not sure that that would take place all the time. And the challenge in the nonprofit sector, unlike the commercial sector, is it's hard to then you know, very nicely um, package people out, as we used to say in the commercial sector. So I think managing governance some of the people issues and the identity issues around the brand. Yeah, I, I just want to say quickly that the point that Tom just made about the CEOs is, is really critical. What happened with, in, in this situation, 
um, was the exception more than the rule, um, but really speaks to the importance of, of focus on mission, um, because the three of them and their boards worked really hard to, to understand the strengths of each of the respective CEOs and to um, hear from them about what their professional interests were and to try and, and meld them together. Thank you, Dallas. Um, Andrew, I'm gonna try not to get too specific about this, but, but when you were talking about the types of combinations that could happen, if, uh, if, if one organization in essence was looking to, not merge, but in essence take a dissolving pro, uh, organization and actually make it a program of the sur surviving organization. Um, so looking, looking at that and then in sort of the, the com so there would be that dissolving en entities piece. And you said something about the, the, the regulatory piece of the requirements for that is fairly simple. Right, you said that the the dissolving entity needed to. What, what did the dissolving entity need to do, and the assuming entity need to do? Sure. Okay. So, in an asset acquisition, and this would be a, 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 an asset acquisition accompanied by dissolution, the acquiring organization's board would need to approve the transaction. The organization that would be dissolving would need, their board would need to approve the transaction. If that organization has legal members, which can be individuals or sometimes entities, if the uh, asset transfer is a substantial amount or all of the assets of that entity, it would need to be approved by the members as well. And the fact of dissolution that the organization would go out of existence would also need to be approved by the board and the membership of that organization. Depending on the state in which the dissolving entity is located, there may be regulatory notifications or consents that would be required prior to affecting the asset transfer or the dissolution. Yeah, and it, Mike, you would still want to do your due diligence on that program that the, new, that the surviving organization would take on because you'd be taking on the risks that might be coming along with that. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure that, you know, it transfers well, the contracts transfer without, you know, need for approval or you get the approval to transfer and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Do, if, if you don't mind, maybe we've got just two more slides to, to hit through and, and then we can get the rest of the questions. Is that, I'm going to quickly run through those. Sure. So I'll quickly run through some of the uh, agreement drafting considerations. Um, one key breakpoint is always whether another party is represented by counsel. And if they're not, from from, from at least this, this chair's perspective, the ethical... Terrible decision. <laughs> <laughs> the, the ethical considerations that are involved in how to communicate with another party um, but even when other organizations are represented by counsel, their counsel may not be familiar with or, or specialized in exempt organization matters, in nonprofit organization matters, and that can sometimes prove challenging in the negotiation process of the back and forth drafts of a definitive agreement or in resolving matters that are related to, to diligence that are necessary to be resolved prior to closing of, of the transaction. So a few key areas in, in, in the drafting. Um, from a governance perspective, it's inc incredibly important to be clear about what the future governance of the organization will look like, either specifying no changes, there may be changes, if there will be changes, to attach the amended governing documents that illustrate the changes. In certain cases, and there are different, different ways to document this, you can identify particular individuals by name. You don't need to, but that's one, that's one approach. Um, I think I'm, I'm going, uh, I guess, counter, counterclockwise. Uh, 
on the purposes and activities, it should be very clear what the organization will be engaged in and doing post combination. On the tax exemption front, what is the tax exempt status of the entity? What should be done if there are any adverse changes or audits that are instituted by governmental authorities in between the time the agreement is signed and closing occurs. And I think related to, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but related to the reps and warranties, what about material changes that occur post-closing? How do you account for that risk and liability and how do you shift it? And especially in a, in a program acquisition context, there may be an exchange of funds. And what is typical in transactions is to hold back a portion of the purchase price to for a certain specified period that normally tracks the length of the reps and warranties, which will survive for a certain period of time, in order to offset any breaches of those representations and warranties or any indemnifiable events that may result out of that breach or warranty. Um, uh, obviously, related, the reps and warranties should be clear about what is being covered. There's garden variety reps and warranties like due authorization, that the agreement's been approved, that the individuals who are signing are authorized to, to sign the agreement, that the organization is in good standing, what's the organization's litigation history, have all documents been disclosed in the diligence process, and uh, that accurate, uh, complete, and, and truthful uh, disclosures have been made by the organization. And if there are issues that need to be carved out of the representation, uh, those should be specifically identified and, and captured. Um, other important terms, uh, dispute resolution, uh, there are a variety of options, traditional litigation, uh, going to court, going before a judge. Sometimes organizations will opt to resolve disputes through uh, alternative methods like arbitration or mediation. And there, one potential benefit of arbitration is that you can select uh, in advance, perhaps, uh, or agree with the other party who will hear the dispute and require it be heard by a subject matter expert rather than the spin of the judicial wheel. Specify the location where disputes will be heard and so on. You also want to specify termination rights and when the agreement will automatically terminate if closing hasn't occurred by a certain date, if the parties, the mechanism for extending closing for waiving closing conditions. Intellectual property is always in, important. Um, even if you are going to merge with uh, another organization or acquire another organization's name and logo uh, in the diligence process to understand what IP protections are available, whether there are in fact infringement issues, um, and, and whether or not there will be any provision specifying the use of intellectual property. And this can come up in a, na a pure naming context. What's the name of the organization going to be? Yeah, and sometimes it's important that, that even with a new name, um, it, it, the legacy names um, still have some value, and there's still so maybe programs associated with it. We just... Um, um, assisted an organization in a, in a major name change, but they kept some products and services with the old name. So uh, those things don't necessarily go away. There's still value to, to the old name sometimes, and, and, and so it's not always a, a done deal that once you sort of merge or combine that it's, it's going to be a new name and the old one just goes away. And I guess uh, the, the key takeaway that I, that I wanted to share from this slide is that not, not only are there many items to be addressed in a definitive combination agreement, but also you, it's possible that both sides are going to have to give and take a little bit and go back and forth and multiple rounds of, 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 of drafting. Um, there may be changes in the perceived uh, plan ahead uh, that the parties may change their minds or there are some other difficulties or obstacles 
uh, uh, that have necessitated a change. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's an important point because we'll talk a little bit about that. Is that, you know, looking at this as a normal iterative process, because again, I think when you get into this, there's a, emotional considerations, there's fiduciary considerations. And I think just managing your expectations that doing this better and doing this right and getting to the right level of detail, it just, it's going to set you up for success in the future and kind of managing the frustrations of time and pace as you go through that you know, rounds of iteration. All right, and I think just in the interest of time, we'll move forward to the next slide. Yeah, so just quickly on this, um, some practical things to keep in mind. Um, one is that, uh, as you heard from all of us, and, and Tom certainly demonstrated, this is a process that takes time. Uh, the negotiations themselves can take um, the context that we've worked in, they've the average four to six months, but could be up to nine months of consistent meetings, of work between meetings, of conversations between meetings. So not only is it uh, a length of time that passes, but also there's a commitment of time by the folks who are involved. And so you need to understand that and have the capacity to be able to run your organization and do your day job, as we call it, as well as do the work that's required of the the partnership or merger discussions. Uh, the second thing to keep in mind is that this is change. Regardless of the relationship that you develop, this is a change process. And so as leaders of your organization, you need to be mindful of that, you need to prepare that, and you need to work with both your staff and your board and whatever other uh, constituencies are involved to be prepared for and to adapt to the change, giving them the opportunity to voice their concerns, voice their excitement, um, but also for you to respond to that change and to do it on an ongoing basis, not to, uh, to have these discussions off in a closet somewhere and then just spring it on someone, um, but to involve to the extent that it's relevant and that you can based on where you are in the conversations, to involve staff to involve donors and funders, to involve mem members, to involve partners, to let them know that these discussions are happening and to sort of get their engagement in the discussion so that, number one, you can have a broader set of, of perspectives folded into the conversation, but also that when you get to the point where a decision is made, assuming you, you get to that point, they understand it, they're, they've bought into it, and they can support the new relationship or the new organization going forward. People may and, and should say people will leave. Because time passes, your CEO may leave, a key board member may leave. That most critical program person who's the most valuable and who built the program from scratch and who everyone in the field thinks is the expert may leave. Uh, you need to be prepared for that and build in institutional support for the discussions and for the process so that the, the departure of one person, whether it's they found another job or they go on short-term leave. Um, you can be prepared for that and continue to move forward with the, with the conversations. Uh, you also want to make sure that you understand the costs and benefits. If you as the CEO are engaged in monthly negotiating sessions and work in between and talking to board members and um, talking to potential donors about this process and managing your staff, that means there's other work that's not getting done. And you need to be okay with saying, I need to spend my time here and not spend my time on this potential opportunity that we as, a, as an organization in a different setting might wanna pursue, but because we've identified this relationship as a priority, we're gonna go forward. The flip side is that new opportunities may emerge that you might not have thought of, and you may wanna jump on them even before you cement the relationship. Um, we often have organizations who um, identify a collaborative uh, situation that's short of, for example, a full-on merger, and they go and they engage and they submit a, a joint grant proposal on a particular project while the merger negotiations are going on, um, which is a nice opportunity to see how you actually work together in, in real time. Um, and can inform the merger negotiations, but also enables you to prove some value both internally and externally to the relationship short of the full-on commitment 
that's involved in some of the relationships we've discussed. Um, and as we've all talked about, it's important to, to make sure that um, constituents are involved and understand. Um, one thing that we've seen a lot with donors and funders is that they, they tend to fall into two camps. Um, either they'll say, this is, this is great, and we're going to give you more money because we fund both of your organizations and we're going to continue to fund you at least at the same level, if not more, because your one and one equals three instead of two. Um, or they say, that's very nice, we'll support your negotiations, but we're going to step back. And we're going to ha you're going to need to prove that this relationship actually warrants at least the same, if not more money. Um, and that's a question that comes up all the time, and it's something that in terms of your initial assessment internally, as well as discussions with your potential partner, needs to be put on the table so that you understand and you're not surprised by the responses of donors that you may um, have in common or may somehow be related. And I would just add, be sure to embrace and don't necessarily run away from the noise. Not everyone may always agree to the, 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 the path ahead and that's that's okay too oh so just to sum up on, on our end um and i think you know it's good follow-up from from scott um you know your, your point about you know perhaps um you know getting engaged in a um, um uh, joint activity before you go full full in there's all sorts of ways to com combine and you know you don't have to run to merge to do it um, in fact merger is, is kind of permanent so um, it, it's better to, to try some of those other forms if you're not entirely sure as an organization or your board's not all in to do one of these joint ventures um, as you go forward that due diligence process as tedious as it can be is very important be aware of what you're getting yourself into as an organization um, and, and and try to look at it um, soberly and, and and understand notwithstanding all the excitement about the possibility of a merger there could be some things that you really should view as deal breakers and some things that you really should say this is a red light we're not going to go past this um, and that you know goes hand in hand with understand what you know, liabilities you are going to be accepting um, make sure you have a good agreement that puts in place all the expectations and, and you know I think that agreement should be comprehensive it's sort of interesting when you go through a merger one organization sort of goes away so in a way the other party to this agreement is sort of no longer there but obviously they're all part and parcel of the surviving entity and that's going to be the document that they look to and say well wait a minute I thought the board was going to have three seats for you know whatever it might be um, it should all be in there um, and yeah it, to the extent there are some some minor hiccups along the way you know they say uh, uh, we have to hang together or surely we will hang separately um, if things do go wrong um, uh, you know it, it, remember that this is sort of a team effort going forward and and you know it's not just um, it, 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 oftentimes it can be, be, be gotten through with support from both sides or all three sides in the case of a uh, merger like uh, Tom said he went through. Um, I, we had a couple of questions from the um, uh, um, the webinar, uh, the, the, the computer there, but, but uh, probably don't have time to get to them. But there's one that, Scott, you touched on that I think maybe a little bit more. Um, what, what if one plus one equals one? And in this instance, I'm talking about you have a donor who's a donor to both organizations. And, oh, well, you've all of a sudden cut my obligations, you know, in half because I'm only going to give the same amount I've always given to you. And, and I don't have to give to the, the disappearing entity. So uh, not, a, not an unusual occurrence, um, at least in the first year following an integration. Um, and so in part, it's a, a decision that needs to be made by the organizations, whether they're comfortable pers uh, proceeding with that loss of funding. Um, but it's also important to, to, from day one, and I think each of us referenced it, but Tom in particular, to be clear about what the, what the value add is, or what's the value proposition of this relationship. And the, the stronger that value proposition is, the stronger you can articulate it and actually have some sort of meat to it, the less likely a funder is going to say, okay, this is great, I get to sort of half my obligation. Because that, and what we're talking about is the value proposition of the relationship, not the value proposition of each organization separate. And if you can actually show in very specific terms that you will strengthen your impact and 
um, to use sort of investment terms, you'll, you'll strengthen the power of their investment, the return on their investment by their continuing to support the relationship at least at the same level, um, that will often um, sort of sway them. But there are certainly times where folks will say, great, I'll write one check, and then we'll sit back and we'll see what happens. Maybe a time for a question or two from the audience. We cut, cut it short before, so if there's, there's one. Right. Thanks. Um, I, I would like to go back to, to the Humentum case for a second. And uh, you all mentioned that a, a, a merger is a very, very strategic decision. And I think, Scott, you said that you should never consider that if there are financial issues. Um, and then you, others mentioned that you need to look into how the mission fits and how it generates is a fit. Um, I would like to see if you may be able to share some of the details of the strategic thought process uh, that triggered this idea of the merger and then how you selected the the candidates for the merger and then how you defined the the two different relationships uh, for the merger. Great, great question. It's like this backdrop, the context uh, that we that I didn't talk about. I think a couple different examples. You know, one, we had all worked in the same sector, so we all knew each other and each other's work. Two is that we had collaborated before. I think George made that point, you know, that if you're going down a path, ultimately, sometimes it's easier to collaborate. And so we had a history of collaboration. And I think third is that we saw a lot of the changes the same way in our conversation. So we could see a different sector emerging. We could see some of the challenges of that. We were also pretty honest about our inability to, as single organizations to address those challenges. And so I think with that as a context, we were able then to work together first as the three CEOs and then bring in our board task force in to say, um, here's a strategy that allows us to accelerate what we did as legacy organizations, but then also do more. And so I think that became very compelling. And then back to this point that how important this is, this became some of what we used then as we went out and talked to different constituencies to say, there is a there there. Here's the rationale for why we're doing this. And so one of the things we did in due diligence was to, we spoke to probably about 40 different individual leaders in our sector to say, we're thinking of doing this. We want to have a confidential conversation. Here's why. Poke holes in it. Test us. Um, what are we missing? And I think that was very helpful for us just to both validate what we were doing strategically. And then secondly, these individuals and their organizations became real champions when we then did our subsequent public launch. I think that's all the time we have. Um, please uh, join me in thanking Scott, Tom, and Andrew. What a great presentation. Very informative today. Um, and uh, we will uh, hopefully see uh, all of you uh, next month at the, at the program on March 19th. So thanks very much.